Last week we talked about the interest rate parity theory. <clears throat> it was a theory that was meant to help us understand the determination of exchange rates in a floating exchange rate system and what can cause changes in those particular exchange rates. We did talk about the... I'll make sure that I'm in the right position. I think we finished up what we needed to cover last week. And most importantly, we talked about how, for example, an increase in U.S. interest rates would cause investors to want to move their funds into the United States, thereby causing an appreciation of the U.S. dollar value and so forth. And we walked through three different examples. We talked a little bit about the more general theory when we incorporate risk or we incorporate liquidity issues and other concerns of investors and how the interest rate parity idea or theory is really focusing on investors moving their funds to places where they can get a, a better rate of return and or a safer investment that they can count on in the future or and or which can give them more liquidity a more ability or safety in terms of turning their currency back into cash at some point in the future. So those are the primary investor concerns. And we can think of countries' currencies as they change in value in a floating system as being somewhat indicators, indicative of investor sentiments about kind of the health and potential for that particular country's economy. Because if investors view a country as being particularly healthy, if they think that in, uh, business is going to grow, that GDP is going to grow rapidly, if they believe that their investments are going to lead to capital gains, if they invest in stocks or if they purchase companies in those particular countries, then you'd expect investments to flood into that particular country, leading to an appreciation of the currency. So, so the appreciations we see might well be reflective of positive investor sentiment about the, the status of that particular country. On the other hand, Investments could flood in because of very, very high interest rates that are prevailing on deposits in a particular country. And sometimes those high interest rates become necessary not because an economy is particularly healthy, but because it's not healthy and yet it needs to borrow a sufficient amount of funds in order to keep itself going. In that case, interest rates may rise really high and investors may well expect a depreciation of that country's currency to occur, but will still invest in it because the rate of return or the interest rate on a deposit there will more than exceed the expected depreciation of the currency that an investor might expect to take place. So you can get kind of mixed messages um, sometimes by looking at interest rates and countries' exchange rates. All right. Today we're going to move onward and talk about the second theory of exchange rate determination, and that is called purchasing power parity, or PPP for short. Now, purchasing power parity focuses attention on traders, exporters and importers who go to the foreign exchange market on a regular basis and exchange currencies for other countries' currencies in order to import and export goods and services. All right, we know that a lot of that takes place on an annual, weekly, daily basis, and so traders are going to have to use the banking system and exchange currencies in order to make that possible. Now, what motivates traders? Whereas investors have a series of concerns about what's going to motivate them to move their investments from one place to another, traders, we're going to imagine, are going to be primarily focused on the price of the goods in different locations. And they're going to seek to purchase products where prices are relatively lower and move them to places where prices are higher in a particular market. So arbitrage is a, part, a particularly, it's an activity that we'd expect traders, currency traders, anyone in markets should tend to try to look for places where you can produce or purchase something at a low price and move them to places in markets where you can sell them at a higher price, thereby making a profit on the difference between those two. However, we would expect that that behavior is going to induce changes in the prices of individual goods. The purchasing power parity theory is derived from another concept or idea in economics that's called the law of one price. The law of one price says that identical products that can be traded between individual markets should have the same price prevailing in those two different markets. Suppose they're not. Suppose you could purchase a bicycle in Mexico 
for, I'll make up a number, 200 US dollars when exchanged at the current exchange rates for pesos. $200. But you know that the market in the United States is selling those very same identical bicycles, the same brand, the same materials, the same everything, but you can sell them in the United States for $300. So $200 in Mexico, $300 in the United States. Now, smart entrepreneurs or traders should say, hey, why don't I go to Mexico, purchase up a bunch of these bicycles at $200 a piece, bring them across the border, sell them in the United States at maybe not $300 where the merchants are currently charging for it, but maybe $275 instead. If I can get $275 for each of those bicycles, I'm going to make $75 per bicycle transported into the U.S. market. I can make money by virtue of moving the product from a low-priced market to a high-priced market. All right, but if lots of people do that particular activity for that particular product, then we're going to see a couple of things take place in the markets themselves. In Mexico, there's going to be suddenly an increase in demand for bicycles, that particular brand of bicycles. The increased demand for those bicycles should lead, lead merchants in Mexico to say, hey, why are we selling out these bicycles so fast? There seems to be a really high demand for them. We can up the price and still sell all of the bicycles that are being demanded. So we might expect the price of the product to rise up in Mexico because of the extra demand. At the same time, Bicycles are being sold in the United States in greater abundance or supply, and that extra supply in the United States is going to force not only 275 bicycles being sold, but the other merchants are going to say, hey, we can't sell $300 bicycles anymore. We're going to have to lower the price to, because there's an extra supply in the, in the marketplace. So the extra supply in the U.S. should lower the price to 275 to 265 to 250 while the price in Mexico goes from 200 up to 225 maybe meeting somewhere in the middle, like at 250. Although it would depend on the supply and demand conditions to know where. Through that process then, we'd expect the same bicycle to sell for the same, say, $250 price in the two markets. Eventually, after the traders realize and kind of work through the price differences that exist for the two different products. Hence, law of one price should prevail. Now, The Economist magazine, a long time ago, probably 20, 20 or 30 years ago now, back in the mid-1980s or early 1990s, The Economist magazine is a good uh, magazine about economic issues around the world, published in Britain. And sometime about 20, 25 years ago, they decided to teach their readers about purchasing power parity. And they thought, well, one way to do that would be to go around the world and try to collect some price data on a product that is identical and sold in many, many different markets around the world. And so they thought about what they could do at that time, and they came up with the following. How about the McDonald's Big Mac? Okay, the McDonald's Big Mac is, McDonald's is everywhere now, right? And McDonald's, although McDonald's can sell and will sell many different products and have different items on their menu in different countries, if they sell a Big Mac in any one of their establishments anywhere in the world, it's always going to be identical. It's always going to be the two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, on a sesame seed bun. You remember that jingle from my childhood. And it's stuck. McDonald's Big Mac. It's more than just another hamburger. There are two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, and onions on a sesame seed bun. Seven great ingredients working together to make one great taste. Two all-beef patties, special sauce, cheese, lettuce, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Get the idea? Two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, and a sesame seed bun. It's your McDonald's Big Mac. You've got to taste it to believe it, you know what I mean? Two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, and a sesame seed bun. Two all-beef patties... Let me say a few words about McDonald's Big Mac. It's a, it's, it's... Two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, and a sesame seed bun. Two all... Well, what, what was that word again? Two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, and a sesame seed bun. That is cheese, cheese, pickles, onions, lettuce, uh, cheese, pickles, and... Oh, well, what am I saying? You deserve a break today at McDonald's. Where your dollar gets a break every day. Gotta be exactly the same product. So, 
The economist thought, let's go around the world and let's find out what is the local prices of Big Mac burgers. And they have kept a record of these all through the years. Every year, every year and a half, they come out with a new record and they post the latest prices and they look at the current exchange rates and they test to see not really whether purchasing power parity works, but really whether the law of one price holds for this particular product. The Big Mac Index. Now, they've gotten much more sophisticated through the years. So now they've got this cool online version where you can look at this map of the world and you can pick any particular country that you like and you can get data about that particular country's Big Mac burgers. So for example, they claim that the price of a Big Mac burger in July of 2016 is $5.04 on average. Seems high to me. Does it seem that way to you? Where I think they get their numbers. They used to get their Big Mac price by looking at the average price of a Big Mac in like New York, Chicago, Atlanta, and San Francisco, or something like that. You know, so that's where they would price their Big Macs, and they take an average of those four. Now, the fact that they have to take an average should start to worry us a little bit because that means that even the price of a Big Mac within the same country is not necessarily the same from place to place. And as you're probably well aware, if you were to go into the middle of Manhattan and purchase a Big Mac at, at McDonald's, it is quite likely to cost you quite a bit more than if you purchased a Big Mac in upstate New York somewhere, right? So the prices of the same burger is going to vary even across a short geographical distance, causing us to worry a little bit perhaps about this whole idea of law of one price. But hold on to that for a minute and let's just go with it and see where we go. Now, pick another country, for example, Mexico. Mexico. And we can see that the price of a Big Mac in Mexico is 44 pesos um, as of July 2016. If we convert it to dollars at the current exchange rate, it works out to be not $5.04, as the law one price would predict, but rather $2.37 instead. So the price of a Big Mac is very, very low in Mexico in comparison to this price of identical product in the United States. All right? Now, that means the law of one price doesn't really hold for this. Now, if we go back to our theory of econ uh, economic theory and say what should happen in order to cause the prices to come together, well, here's where we would tell the following story. Well, given that you can get cheap Big Macs in Mexico, you should go across the border to, say, Tijuana. <laughs> you should buy up a whole bunch of Big Macs one day. You put them into a truck, heat it, come across the border, and in San Diego, you can sell the Big Macs out of your truck for not $5 per Big Mac, but maybe $4.50 or $4, and you can make a bundle by doing that. Once again, tell the same story of changes in demand and supply, should cause the prices of Big Macs to equalize. My question to you is, why doesn't that happen? Why are the prices different for Big Macs in different countries? How could it persist? What, what, what goes wrong in this whole theory? Yeah. There's a, there's a what? There's a tariff at the border. So there might be a tax collected by customs officials at the border that's going to add to your cost of bringing it across the border into the United States. So that's one thing. What else? The supply chains might be longer for some places than they are for others. Supply chains might be longer. That means the cost of getting it to that product. So you think maybe the cost of getting it to the United States would be more expensive than getting it to Mexico. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. It's a controlled supply chain. So McDonald's has a monopoly. So there's no real way for you to actually go down there, buy up those big packs and go sell them. You could buy them. Selling them is the problem. Right. right? So you bring them across the border, and then you're going to claim, I've got McDonald's Big Macs for sale. But they've got a trademark on that particular brand name and that product. You can't really sell them it unless you've got some sort of a franchise license or something like that. And if you did have a franchise license and they discovered that you're going across and buying them there and bringing them back, you'd probably be in trouble and I'm sure it goes against their rules. So there's some legal issues that would prevent you from doing that with Big Macs. Yeah. Uh, there's also a difference in income, um, like cost of living in each of the countries. So cost of living could be different, but we could still imagine that equalization of prices could still prevail. So even though it might cost differences and there's differences in demand, remember the trader, the entrepreneur can go abroad, buy it cheap, bring it back. That should tend to equalize the prices of a tradable good 
even if there are differences in incomes in the two different countries. So you can equalize the price even with that in place. But in the back. People, yeah? I was going to say, but wouldn't people in Mexico just stop buying them then if they got too expensive to try to equalize out? Well, the demand would fall, but you're, you're still getting some kind of equilibrium price. So if the price goes up in Mexico, yeah, you'll sell fewer Big Macs, that's for sure. But you could still, because of trade, sort of force an equalization of the prices, even if the costs you know, or the income levels of people in different countries tend to be different. Yeah. Uh, costs of things like rent for the restaurants in uh, Mexico and in California, or okay. like your previous example. Now, that's an important aspect because the... The land that you're using to sell your product out of, the price of rent is going to vary perhaps significantly between two different countries. And this is the same reason why you'd expect a Big Mac in Manhattan to sell for a different price than a Big Mac in upstate New York. You might say, well, why not just get a truck and move them from upstate New York to Manhattan? Or what could happen or should happen in order to equalize the prices of the rents and the answer to that would be all we really should do is pick up some land from upstate New York, drop it in Manhattan, so there's more land and the price of land goes down to equalize the land. That, of course, can't happen. It doesn't happen. And therefore, you can maintain these differences in prices because of that. Yeah. Cost of transportation. Transportation cost. Big effect, too. You've got to move the product from one location to another, and that could upset, that could add to your cost of moving it from the low price market to the high price market and you need a bigger wedge in order to make it possible. Yeah. Two things. Um, in Mexico, the prices might be lower because of the cultural aspect as well, that maybe people prefer more cultural food or other foods than a big That's price. still true. That's still not, I don't think, going to cause an unequalization of the prices. It's going to change their total demand, but the supply would change in order to equalize the prices. The trading process should eliminate so you might end up with the price the same, and yet you'll have a much smaller demand in Mexico because maybe the cultural effects would mean they just don't want to buy as many Big Macs. Yeah. Might have a much higher kind of desire or demand in the United States. So the prices could still be the same, and you'd have a bigger market because of the cultural desire for Big Macs in the U.S. relative to Mexico. But also, on, from the U.S. side, it might be higher because like, you can't bring bring in Big Macs from Mexico because of the cultural, uh, because of the legal aspects of it, as in there's embargoes on bringing in food or like food that is prepared that way or food that has trademark. Okay, so we've got certain restrictions on food imports into a particular country and even across borders within the United States. We have to worry about pests, we have to worry about food quality, so it could be controls that are going to be looked at. And certainly, if you've got a bunch of burgers in little Styrofoam cups that you're bringing across the border and you say, it's okay, I'm going to sell them over there, you know, the health officials might decide that this is not the safest way to be transporting food and might get into your way. Yeah. Uh, so people don't have perfect information, so they might not know what someone's paying in a different state, so that could be the reason that Absolutely. Okay, so in order for this theory of trade to work, you've got to imagine that everybody always, that there's enough people who know about the price differences that exist in different places, and they've got the inclination to carry out a scheme whereby they go and buy the low price goods and move it to the other. So you need perfect information or good information for enough people in order to make that whole process possible. All right, so that's a good list of things that are going to arise naturally, both across countries, but also within countries, that's going to make it difficult for a product to secure exactly the same price in different locations of sale. And that's one of the reasons why we do indeed get price differences across markets. Although, I'll tell you, I'm confused a little bit about why there can be price differences for, like, do you ever go online to search for a product like, say you want to buy a camera, and you've identified exactly the camera you want to buy. So you say, I want to buy a Nikon S3000 or something. It's like, that's the one I want. So now I'm going to go onto the internet and I'm going to see what price I can get for it. And you're going to see all these merchants selling exactly that same product, and you'll see all sorts of different prices for it. And I wonder to myself, I always kind of look at what is the price, what's the shipping charge, look at the ratings, you know, see if people have had a good experience with that particular merchant. And you'll find like 20, 25 that have prices, ratings, things are acceptable. You figure out the mailing expenses, how much is it going to cost to get to you, 
And there'll be great deviations sometimes in the prices of exactly the same good. And I wonder, I always buy the cheapest one. I mean, you know, that's reached a certain level of quality assurance. But yet, all these other merchants are selling the same product at a higher, like who buys those products? It puzzles me. Yeah? I think some of them are actually gray market where they're from China, but they're, they cut the distributor out, so they're selling it for less money. They might be that, but oftentimes these are, you know, what you would claim or think are reputable camera companies or something like that that are selling, and they say it's a new product, it's in a new box, it's not secondhand, it's not. Now you got to trust and hope that that's true, and maybe that's not true in all instances. But still, you'll see quite a bit of variation in the prices of the same good. Well, this theory of law of one price doesn't work perfectly. And it doesn't work for Big Macs. If we go around the world again and look at some other countries, take a look at Brazil. Uh, Brazil, the price is close to the US dollar price, 15.5 reals, it works out to $4.78. If you look at this map more generally, any place where there is a red coloration, and the darker the red it is, the cheaper you're gonna find a Big Mac. So let's, let's look at Russia. In Russia, you can get a Big Mac today for 130 rubles, which at the current exchange rate is going to get you a Big Mac for $2.05. Good deal. Okay, on the other hand, if you look at this chart on the right, you can see all of the countries that have Big Macs which are priced lower in dollar terms at current exchange rates. That's all of these countries. And you can see that there are only three countries today where the price of a Big Mac is higher, the highest of which is Switzerland. See, what is the price in Switzerland? Six fifty nine, six sixty four Big Mac. Six point five Swiss francs at the current exchange rate that works out to be quite expensive. And the second most expensive country is Norway and Sweden followed closely thereafter. It used to be about five years ago or so that the United States and Big Mac was kind of in the middle of this list, with many countries more expensive, many countries cheaper. All right. Big Mac prices are not the same everywhere. Somehow, though, economists don't dis let that dissuade them from going ahead and deriving a whole theory about purchasing power parity. And we're going to go ahead and do that. So if we take the law of one price with Big Macs and sort of write it out, we're going to get something like this. The price of a Big Mac, BM, in dollar terms, is going to be equal to the price of a Big Mac in, say, peso terms, times the exchange rate between dollars and pesos. So I take the current exchange rate, multiply it by the peso Big Mac price. It should work out if law of one price holds. Then that equality should be satisfied. Alternatively, we can rewrite this equation as follows. We could say that the exchange rate between dollars and pesos, if the law of one price held for this particular good, should work out to be equal to the price of a Big Mac in dollar terms divided by the price of a Big Mac in peso terms. So put dollars on the top, pesos on the bottom, take the ratio of the price of a particular product. If law of one price holds, then that should be equal to the exchange rate that prevails on the market. We can see from the data that that's rarely true. But, pushing forward nonetheless, let's just suspend our disbelief for a few minutes. Suppose that it might be true in some circumstances, and think about how we would aggregate this particular relationship across many, many goods within a particular economy. And that's what the purchasing power parity theory does. It's kind of like saying, well, maybe it won't hold for a particular good like the Big Mac, but we might expect that there's a better chance of it holding for lots of different goods. So maybe some goods are overpriced in one market, but other goods are underpriced. And when we average it across all of these different products that are potentially sellable in two markets, maybe we'll end up with the aggregated version of this holding with some degree of accuracy. Now, to turn this into an aggregate theory, and basically to go from law of one price to PPP, we do the following. Leave the exchange rate here as dollars per peso, but instead of writing the price of a particular good, we're now going to calculate the price of a whole basket of goods that might be purchased within a particular country. 
And I'm going to call that price or cost of a basket CB and put a, put a dollar next to it and say, suppose we've got, I don't know, 100 or 1,000 different items. We've got one of these and two of those and five of these and 10 of those and one of these. And we add up all of these different products and like with a shopping basket walking through the store, we go, say one of these, one of these, one of these. You go to the checkout counter, they tell you, here's how much it costs today in dollar terms. Okay, so that's the cost of a basket of goods in the United States. Now, we divide that by the cost of a basket of goods in peso terms in Mexico. Again, lots of different items that are being collected, put into the basket, but they should be the same items in the U.S. as are being evaluated for prices in Mexico. So you want to look for identical items as best you can, and you're going to compare the prices of baskets of goods between the two countries. Now, if purchasing power parity is true, we're going to expect that the cost of these baskets of goods, ratio of them, will work out to be equal to the exchange rate. Or another way to say this is that the exchange rate that does equalize the ratio of baskets of goods, or is equal to that, is what we might call the PPP exchange rate. Now, another way to write that then is take that PPP exchange rate and rewrite it as E, PPP, times dollar, or dollar per P, times the cost of a basket in peso terms is going to be equal to the cost of a basket of good in dollar terms. So this is where purchasing power parity is holding true. We're imagining that the PPP exchange rate is going to be the exchange rate that equalizes the cost of a basket of goods in Mexico, that's the left-hand side, with the cost of a basket of goods in the U.S. side. That's the parity. The basket of goods are equally priced if the PPP exchange rate holds true. Now, what's going to change? Here's how the PPP theory works. If we put the dollar per peso exchange rate back here and write it as the ratio of the basket of goods prices, one of the things that affects the cost of a basket of goods in the United States, I'm going to put this as a function, is the price level that prevails in the United States. And one thing that affects the cost of a basket in pesos is the price level P. So we're going to think about that P dollar and PP, P peso, as the U.S. Consumer Price Index. That's the index that's used to measure the average level of prices of a basket of goods that are purchased by a typical household in the United States. And the cost of a basket in Mexico is going to be related to the price index, the consumer price index in Mexico, measured in peso terms. Now the point of this exercise is to ask, well, what happens if, suppose, P dollar, the U.S. price index, goes up? If the price index goes up, ceteris paribus, all else equal, we're not changing anything else in the market. If the price of dollar goods go up, then we would argue that this is going to cause an increase in the cost of a basket of goods in dollar terms, right? The increase in the cost of a basket of goods in dollar terms is going to mean that if we take E dollar peso times CB peso, that's going to be less than the cost of a basket in US dollar terms. CB has gone up, so therefore CB dollar is now greater than the basket of goods in Mexico evaluated at the current exchange rate, if PPP prevailed originally. So what would happen? In the theory, here's what happens. Because U.S. goods are relatively more expensive compared to Mexican goods, we're going to expect merchants or traders to say, hey, why don't I buy up more of the goods in Mexico, bring them across the border, sell them in the U.S. at the higher prices that now prevail. So this is going to lead to an increased demand for Mexican goods and services because they're relatively cheaper now compared to the U.S. goods and services. But that in turn is not going to affect the prices of the goods in Mexico and the U.S. like we had told in the Law of One Price story. Now we're going to imagine that this increased demand for Mexican goods and services causes an increased demand for pesos on the foreign exchange market. And that's the change that takes place in telling this as an aggregate story and converting it into a story about purchasing power parity prevailing. 
Now, the increase in demand for pesos, in turn, is going to cause what to happen to the dollar per peso exchange rate if the exchange rate is floating, if the currencies are floating with respect to each other. What happens to that exchange rate? If the uh, demand for pesos goes up, step back one second. What happens to the value of the peso if the demand for pesos in the foreign exchange market goes up? It's going to go up. So higher demand for pesos is going to cause the peso value to go up relative to the dollar. Is this exchange rate the value of the peso or the value of the dollar? Peso. Value of the peso. So what's going to happen to this exchange rate? It's going to go up. <clears throat> so what we end up ha having happen is when there's an increase in the cost of a basket of goods in the U.S., this numerator rises, it's going to cause the exchange rate to go up, thereby maintaining the purchasing power parity relationship. The PPP should always prevail because traders are going to be moving their goods back and forth in order to, and through that behavior, it's going to equalize the cost of baskets of goods in two different countries. That's the idea behind PPP. The problem is all of the things that we mentioned before that would tend not to cause equalization of prices, even for individual specific goods. And for those same reasons, we really should probably expect that aggregated goods or baskets of goods are probably not going to become equalized either. And indeed, when we look at the data, we discover that that's generally true. PPP exchange rates do not prevail, do not mimic the actual exchange rates that prevail in floating exchange rate markets most of the time. Sometimes they'll be equal by chance. So if we go back and look at the Big Mac prices here, you'll notice that Sweden is about as close as you can get to the price of a Big Mac. Now let's see, what does Sweden come out at? $5.23 as opposed to $5.04. PPP at the current Swedish krona U.S. dollar exchange rate. Swedish krona dollar exchange rate at that exchange rate is pretty close to the PPP exchange rate that would prevail, at least for Big Macs. And maybe that's true for baskets of goods between the two markets as well. By chance and by kind of adjustments over time, we've ended up with close to PPP exchange rates with one country. But for most other countries, they don't seem to prevail. So now, we've got a couple of options. Option number one is we could just throw this theory away and stop thinking about it or talking about it because it doesn't really seem to work very well for specific goods or for baskets of goods. However, economists are a little bit wary of just throwing a good idea like this away. So there's a couple of things that have been done to salvage the PPP theory. One thing that's been done is to envision or imagine that the PPP exchange rate might be an exchange rate that an economy will tend towards in the long run. That the PPP exchange rate can be expected to prevail, maybe not moment by moment, year by year. But eventually, if you end up with a country where the prices of lots and lots of different goods are just a lot lower in one country than they are in another country, then over time we might expect that trade is eventually going to whittle away at those price differences, that people are going to buy the goods in the cheaper countries, move them to the countries where the prices are dearer or higher, and that eventually we're going to kind of tend our way towards that long-run exchange rate. I'm going to draw a quick graph just to illustrate this idea. Put time on one axis, and we're going to plot two things on the vertical axis. We're going to plot the ratio of baskets of goods, CB dollar over CB peso, and we're going to plot the exchange rate, dollars <coughs> per peso. Now let's suppose we just imagine, I'm going to make up a trend for the cost of a basket of goods in the U.S. relative to Mexico. So let's suppose that goods in the U.S. have become more and more expensive over time relative to the peso basket of goods over the period of time that we're talking about. And so let's imagine that CB dollar peso kind of moves, I'll just make up some wavy line that increases. So this is CB dollar over CB peso. Again, I just made up that line. And let's imagine that we're talking about 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So when we're talking about long run, we're talking about a long period of time that prevails um, between these two countries. 
Now, if we plotted the exchange rate between dollars and pesos on the same graph, here's what it might look like. Now, exchange rates, by the way, in a floating exchange rate system, they jump around a lot. They go up and they go down and they go up and down. So I'm going to make up a, a wavy, a very wavy line here. Maybe it'll look something like this. Okay. Try to draw something exactly like that. <laughs> now, we look at the trends over a long period of time. Again, we're looking at like 40 or 50 years, imagining that. The trend on prices between baskets of goods in the U.S. and Mexico is the, is the slope or approximate trend line that would look like this, following that wavy line moving up. But if we were to like plot the line that best fits this particular wavy exchange rate movement, we would get a line that looks uh, pretty close to the line that's drawn there. Now, at any particular point in time, like here, we might have an exchange rate in actual terms. The actual exchange rate is very different than the PPP exchange rate, which would be up there. And that might prevail for a very long period of time, maybe even 10 years or more. But eventually, things kind of come back, maybe you overshoot a little bit, but you get back onto the trend and kind of follow, on average, the same trend as the cost of baskets of goods would prevail. And that's kind of the trick to turning a day-by-day spot-on theory, which doesn't really work in the real world, into a theory that might have some validity but it's going to be a lot more complicated to evaluate and to test to see whether it's really true or not. Because you can't even look at exchange rates over 10 years and say, is this close enough to PPP or not? You've got to look at a very long series of data and see if the trends tend to follow the same directions. Now, economists have tested long-run determinations of exchange rates and checked to see if ratios of baskets of goods tend to match the data in a long-term sense. And the studies that I've seen and read about suggest that the, the result is mixed. There's not firm evidence that it does follow this trend. There's not really firm evidence. It's, it's still kind of an open question. Now, here's another reason, though, why I think we might actually want to just kind of throw this whole theory away and why we might not really look to trader behavior as having a very influential effect upon the exchange rate in a particular market, foreign exchange market in a floating, term, in a floating exchange rate system. And the reason for that is to recognize the very small role that traders are even playing in the day-by-day -day foreign exchange market. I think I mentioned to you the total amount of trades that take place in the foreign exchange market on a daily basis. And it's estimated to be somewhere between one or two trillion dollars and like five trillion dollars of currency being traded between countries every day. But when we look at the total amount of trade for goods and services, the exports and import values that are taking place daily, it amounts to less than a hundred billion dollars per day. So one to five trillion dollars of currency is being traded, but only maybe at most a hundred billion of that even has anything to do with buying and selling currencies in order to exchange for goods and services. So the total amount of supply and demand for currencies in exchange for each other is dominated by investor behavior and decisions. Yes, traders are buying and selling currencies, but they are playing such a small role in the market that what they do is going to get wiped out, canceled out by what investors are doing on any particular day, and they're going to be basing their decisions not on price data directly, but on things like interest rates and returns on um, stock market values and things like that. So for a lot of those reasons, PPP is a pretty abysmal theory in trying to explain day-to-day -day fluctuations in currency values. All right, but there's one more reason to present this and teach it. And that's because it actually, by doing this exercise, and coming up with a so-called PPP exchange rate, it actually gives us a vehicle to help make better comparisons between countries. 
Now, a lot of times, we want to be able to evaluate the standards of living of people in different countries. And it's hard to do that because we're keeping track of their well-beings using currency units, and different countries use different currencies. So if you want to compare the well-being of a worker in U.S. with the well-being of a worker in China, you could calculate what their average wages are. But the average wage in the U.S. is going to be denominated in dollars. The average wage in China is going to be denominated in RMB or UN. And how do you make a comparison between those? Well, the natural way to compare those is to just take whatever is the current exchange rate, exchange the UN for dollars at the current exchange rate, and come up with a dollar value. Then you can compare the dollar incomes of the average worker in the two countries, and you can know who's doing better. Except that you can't. Or at least you can't do that and have a valid or good way of comparing the purchasing power or the ability, the standard of living that's able to be achieved by those individual incomes that you're now comparing. <clears throat> and the reason you can't make that comparison using current exchange rates all the time is because PPP doesn't hold. And we know it doesn't hold. So if you do comparisons across country using current exchange rates, you're likely to overestimate or underestimate the well-being of people in other countries. All right, so how do we get around that problem? The way to get around it is to go through this exercise where we calculate costs of baskets of goods in two different countries, and we form the ratio of those costs of baskets, and we construct a purchasing power parity exchange rate. Now that exchange rate is a made up number, but it's informed by the price differences that exist for identical commodities sold in different markets. Then when we compare the costs of baskets and we calculate that exchange rate, if we convert incomes using that PPP constructed exchange rate, we now are equalizing the purchasing power of the incomes of the individuals. We're like treating it as if the price of a, uh, a dozen eggs is the same. The price of a movie is the same. The price of all of the different items that a consumer might buy are equalized in a sense when we use that purchasing power parity exchange rate. And thus we get not a perfect measure, we get an estimated measure of the differences in well-being uh, of individuals across countries. All right, so. The exchange rate, that is the PPP exchange rate, is going to be given as the exchange rate that equalizes the cost of baskets, and on this graph, it's going to be this exchange rate, dollars per peso. Following this wavy line, that's going to be the PPP exchange rate that prevails at any moment in time. But now, we can introduce some terminology. It is common to compare the actual exchange rate that prevails on a market with the PPP exchange rate that can be constructed using this cost of basket method. So if we take this particular point right here, this point in time on the graph, and note that at this particular point, the actual exchange rate is less than the PPP exchange rate, which is read off of this wavy line, these two. So the PPP exchange rate is greater than the actual exchange rate. And if we take further note, and are accurate in the way we're describing this, which I'm not being right now, if we take note that this is the dollar per peso exchange rate, and so what we're really saying is that the PPP value of the, of the peso is greater than the actual value of the peso. Let me put it another way. The actual value of the peso, in terms of dollars, is less than the PPP value of the peso. Okay, because actual is less than PPP peso value, we're going to say that the peso is undervalued. The actual PPP, or I'm sorry, the actual peso value, the current exchange rate is less than the PPP peso value exchange rate, then the peso is undervalued. The dollar, thereby, is overvalued.
Now, when we use the term over and under valuation here, there's a couple of issues and problems I want to point out. The first problem with using the terminology overvalued, or the main problem I see with using this terminology, is that by using the terminology over and undervalued for a currency, it's making it seem, perhaps unintentionally, but it's making it seem as if there's a correct value for the exchange rate. That the correct value is the PPP exchange rate. And if your currency is undervalued, well, something's wrong. And if your currency is overvalued, well, that too, something is wrong. And it's supposed to be at the correct value. But for all of the reasons we just walked ourselves through in this class, we should recognize that there's no real reason why the exchange rate should be at the PPP value. And there's lots of good reasons why it won't be at the PPP value. Why differences in costs of goods can be persistent even though identical goods are, are selling in those two different markets. Okay, so there's no real natural reason to think that PPP is an equilibrium, that we're going to get there, and that that's going to be the final resting point where everybody is happy. There is no such thing like that. But we persist in using this concept of overvaluation and undervaluation. Okay, there's another way in which we use the term over and undervaluation. Sometimes it matches perfectly with the PPP concept, but sometimes it doesn't. Another way we've used this terminology is to say that, you know, for example, the United States has a trade deficit with, um, with China and with many other countries around the world. So we might say, here's how we could fix this problem. If only the U.S. dollar value would go downward. If the U.S. Value, dollar value went down, depreciated in value, then that's going to make foreign goods more expensive and it's going to make U.S. goods cheaper to foreigners because their currencies are going to appreciate in value. So if we could simply lower the dollar value, then trade would become balanced. We would export more because foreigners would want to buy more of our cheaper goods, and they would, they would export less to us. We would import less. I'm saying this wrong. Let me start over again. We would export more, and we would import less, and our trade balance would come to zero because of a depreciation of the U.S. dollar. So if the U.S. dollar should be a lower value to get trade to be balanced, then we could say that the actual value of the dollar is too high, right? We could say the dollar is overvalued relative to what would be necessary in order to balance trade between the U.S. and the rest of the world. All right? And lots of people will make that point and make that comment. Now, to make that point, though, means to suggest that trade balance is the appropriate goal for a country. That somehow, when you're not in balanced trade, something is wrong, and we need to get ourselves to balanced trade. And one way to get ourselves there is for the exchange rate to change, or to try to force a change in the exchange rate so that balanced trade can come about, and then everybody will be happy. But you should know from before that balanced trade is nothing that is necessary for a country to persist in, and that there's, in some ways, nothing necessarily wrong with having a trade deficit or a trade surplus, because what it represents is borrowing and lending that's taking place net with the rest of the world. Borrowing and lending, to a certain degree, is not problematic, and may even persist for a very long period of time for a country, like it has in the United States, and may turn out not to be a long-term threat or a problem for the economy. So there is nothing magical about trade balance or necessary for trade balance, and therefore there's no necessity that in a floating exchange rate system that somehow the exchange rate should move to the level where trade balance is persistent or that it should move to the level where purchasing power parity exchange rate and equalizations of goods should be equal. There's no good reason why that should necessarily come about. And yet, lots of observers of the economy are constantly suggesting policies that would try to push us in those directions. Now, there is another way to think about what is the right level of exchange rate for a country to have. And this one is based more on the way in which markets work. And I think we have a better, more plausible reason to suggest that the exchange, that this exchange rate is the right exchange rate that should prevail. And that exchange rate is 
whatever the exchange rate is that equalizes supply and demand of currencies at a particular point in time. In other words, if you let your currency flow with respect to the world, rest of the world's currencies, and you let individual banks trade at whatever rate will satisfy the equalization of supply and demand, then that's the appropriate exchange rate to prevail because it is equalizing supply and demand for currencies within the world. Now, maybe that will lead to an overvalued or undervalued exchange rate with respect to PPP, but that can persist for a very long time. And maybe it's because of investors making investment decisions. It's leading PPP not to be satisfied, but that can be okay because trade balance is not a necessity. PPP is not a necessity that has to prevail over a period of time. So we get caught up in these discussions a lot of time in policy circles and we keep talking about, well, this is the wrong exchange rate. We talk about China a lot of times. We say China is, is a currency manipulator, and they're keeping their currency at too low of a value. It shouldn't be at the value it's at. It should be at a higher value. Why? Because that would generate balance of trade between the U.S. and China, and that would make everybody happier. Uh, well, no, it wouldn't necessarily do that. And it's not necessarily something we ought to be trying to change our macroeconomic policies around in order to achieve because there's no reason why PPP exchange rates should prevail or why trade balance should necessarily prevail between two different countries. That's not an objective goal. It should not be a goal that we're trying to achieve because there's nothing magical about trade balance or PPP exchange rates. Back to overvalue and undervaluation. This is the mechanical way of calculating overvaluation and undervaluation. We find the PPP exchange rate, we compare it to the actual exchange rate, and we determine which currency is over and undervalued. But there's another way to think about that, and that is, let me go back to the PPP, the Big Mac index. And that's kind of the intuitive way of understanding overvaluation and undervaluation. And this is how this would work. If you're a traveler, and you go from country to country, and you purchase similar goods in different locations, you've probably discovered that in some places in the world, things seem pretty cheap to you. And in other places of the world, things might seem pretty expensive, where the thing in question is the same item being compared in two different locations. So we can do that with Big Macs. And note that you know, if you take your dollars and you go to Switzerland, as an example, and you purchase a Big Mac at, what was it, 6.7 Swiss francs or something like that. Mm -hmm. After having converted your dollars into Swiss francs, most of us would go to, could, uh, into that McDonald's and go, oh my gosh, you know, Big Macs are really expensive in Switzerland. And if you found that was true for Big Macs, you're probably going to find that it's true for movies in Switzerland, for, for anything that you might consume. You're going to compare based on your current exchange rates that you've made in exchange for Swiss francs, and you're likely to go, oh my gosh, this is expensive, this is expensive, that's expensive. Lots of different things are expensive in Switzerland. Now, when you discover that in a particular tourist location, what does that mean about the value of the dollar? Undervalued or overvalued with respect to the Swiss franc? Undervalued. It doesn't seem to go as far. It doesn't buy as much in Switzerland. So the dollar is undervalued in countries where prices seem expensive, prices seem high for the same goods that you would have purchased in the U.S. On the other hand, oh, and in contrast, then the Swiss franc relative to the dollar would be overvalued. Now, you turn it around and you take your U.S. dollar and you go to Ukraine. And in Ukraine, you can buy a Big Mac for $1.57. And you might be able to find a bunch of other goods in Ukraine, which are cheaper. You might find that a cab ride from <clears throat> one place to another is a lot cheaper than it is in, U in the U.S. You might find that your hotel room is cheaper. You might find that food is cheaper. You might find that a whole bunch of things <clears throat> just seem cheaper when you've converted your dollars to Grivna at the current exchange rate. Well, in that circumstance, the dollar would be overvalued in comparison to the Ukrainian currency. And the Ukrainian currency would be undervalued. So the intuition between um, 
intuition of overvaluation and undervaluation has a lot to do with where is it cheaper to live or to, to, to consume things and where is it more expensive. And in that context, it can give us some usefulness or some, some validity in application because it can help us identify good tourist locations. But the other thing the PPP exchange rate does, and this is perhaps the most important thing, is as I mentioned, you can calculate the PPP exchange rates. And the OECD does a record of these and it keeps track of all PPP exchange rates. And it converts income levels between countries using PPP exchange rates instead of actual exchange rates. And we've already seen a little bit about this. So if we go back to GDP per capita, here's the wiki page for it. And we can look at, for example, these are the IMF numbers for different countries and see Luxembourg is at the top of the list, the United States is at 55,000 um, and comes up number five. And you've got actual um, PPPs per person, but these are when we convert at the current exchange rate. That gives us nominal GDP per person and it would be the less appropriate way of making conversions because it's not equalizing the costs of standard goods between the two countries. So the alternative way is to look at PPP per capita in um, GDP per capita in PPP terms. And you'll notice here that actually quite a few more countries jump up above the United States. We're at number 10 now instead of number five. Um, and that must be whenever the values go up and moving from nominal conversions to PPP conversions, whenever the value goes up, that means that the dollar is, oh, let me get this right, is um, overvalued with respect to that currency or that currency is undervalued at the current exchange rate. So when you convert it PPP, the numbers go up. That's what we see, for example, to give you a good comparison is let's look at, well, let's look at the world GDP. Where is that? World GDP per person is $15,000 in PPP terms. When we look at it in nominal terms, it is, I think it was 10,000, right? 10,000. Okay, that means at current exchange rates, we're basically undervaluing the standard of living that people are obtaining um, with the production that we're, we've got. That exchange rates are somehow keeping the values too low relative to actual consumption levels. When we convert every country's currency using PPP exchange rates, the PPP per person, or uh, GDP per person rises up by, by full 50% from about 10,000 to about 15,000. And that gives us a better indication then of how far individual incomes are going and what standards of living happen to be within a country on average. We saw the same numbers, and I think we talked about this before with China. So China is a good example of a large country, 1.3 billion people, who with, um, this is PPP or now this is PPP. So with PPP, we've got $14,000 per person, just a little bit below the world average. So China is almost at the world average using PPP exchange rates. But let's take a look at it with nominal terms. In nominal terms, China is also, I guess, a little bit below the average at $7,000 or $8,000. But $8,000 sounds a lot worse than $14,000. And it shows the average standard of living when we split up China's GDP across all people equally is quite a bit higher than you would obtain by looking at it using the nominal exchange rates. So any time you want to do some kind of comparisons across countries, when you care about kind of the measuring the standard of living or how far that income is going, you're going to want to always use PPP exchange rates in order to make those conversions. Converting things at nominal exchange rates might be useful for some purposes, but it's not going to be useful for making comparisons of standards of living in some way. So for example, if you want to compare, oh, what does an average construction worker in the United States make compared to in Europe? Who makes more money? You can convert those incomes on average at current exchange rates, but you're not going to get a good representation of the standards of living that can be obtained with those particular incomes. So you should use PPP exchange rates. The World Bank is an example. Prior to about 2000 or so, they used to report, and they still do, GDPs per capita for countries around the world, and they kept track of that. 
They always used to report it before about 2000, maybe a little bit earlier than that. They always used to report it using the nominal current exchange rate because that was the easily obtainable data. But recognizing that that was not the most appropriate way to make comparisons, they're now converting things using PPP exchange rates and making those the public presentation of what average GDPs per person are uh, in countries around the world. Okay, so this is an important thing you should know about and thing that you should incorporate into any kind of work that you do or studies that you do in comparing well-beings of people across different countries that um, are measuring things in different currencies. And hence, PPP becomes important to know about for that reason. Okay, that's it on PPP. Okay, we want to work our way next to the discussion about fixed exchange rates and how they work. And make a comparison in the end between fixed and floating exchange rates. So as we mentioned in the introduction to exchange rates, um, countries can choose really whether they want to allow their currency to float on the market and let it be determined by private market forces. Uh, in that instance, supply and demand of currencies is going to adjust every day and banks are going to adjust the rate every day and the currency value with respect to another country is going to continually float up and down, up and down, and it's going to move around. If a country just leaves its currency alone and lets it move with the market, it's a pure float. But sometimes countries, even in a floating exchange rate system, intervene or step in and try to push the currency value in one direction or another. Now, one of the reasons why countries do this is kind of following on on the point I made earlier. Sometimes countries will look at their trade imbalance and say, you know, this has got to stop. We're running large trade deficits. We need to get rid of them. And one way we might be able to get rid of them is to force a devaluation, no, to force a depreciation of your currency. Uh, if you could push the value of your currency down, then foreign goods are going to become more expensive, your goods are going to become cheaper to foreigners, and you could eliminate a trade imbalance or a trade deficit by virtue of that. That's the thinking. So maybe you'd want to be able to push your currency values up or down. Now, how could we do that? Let's take a look at two countries. And let's do this. See, how do I want to do this? Which country should I choose? Well, let's stick with Britain. The um, supply of pounds and the demand for pounds. And we have some equilibrium or some exchange rate that we're at at the moment. Let's call it E1 or E prime. Now, the first question for you is, suppose we want to push the value of the dollar downward, cause a depreciation of the dollar. Which way do we want the equilibrium exchange rate to move, up or down? We want it to move up, because this is the value of the pound. We want the dollar to depreciate. We need E dollar per pound to go upward. If we want the value of the pound to go, so we want the dollar to go down, we want the pound to go up in value. How can we cause the pound value to go up? Well, one way to do that is to increase the demand for pounds on the market. If we increase the demand for pounds on the market, the demand for pounds line is going to shift outward to D prime, and the exchange rate will, in equilibrium, rise up, and the dollar will depreciate in value. Now, how could we make that happen? And we want to make that happen from the perspective of the government of the United States, let's say. So let's say the U.S. government wants to cause a dollar depreciation to occur for whatever reason. Okay, so one way in which it can make this happen is it could enter the Fed, central bank could enter the foreign exchange market. And by entering the Forex, it's going to be this new participant in the market that wasn't there yesterday. And they're going to have to make the following kind of transaction. They're going to have to increase demand for pounds. And in order to buy pounds, what are they going to sell in exchange? This is the Forex market, remember? So what do they sell? They sell dollars. 
So the Fed enters the 4X and buys pounds and sells dollars. Because on the flip side of this higher demand for pounds is an increase in the supply of dollars to the marketplace in exchange for pounds. That's a dollar sign. So buy pounds and sell dollars. Now the Fed does that, if it were to do that, then where does it get the dollars from? It's our central bank. Where does the central bank get these new dollars that it needs in order to make this transaction? Hmm? They print them. Print them. Yeah, and printing dollars from the Fed's perspective is little more than saying, we're going to make a little accounting notation in our books. And that accounting notation says that the bank that we just um, bought pounds from, we're going, to, we're going to up your account by, say, a million dollars, okay, in exchange for the pounds we just bought. So suddenly, an accounting notation is made. New money is available to the bank because they sold pounds to the Fed, and the Fed has given the bank some newly created money that's come out of nowhere. All right, the Fed can just create the money. So this process is going to actually cause an increase in the money supply in the U.S. So this is U.S. money supply. And its immediate effect in the market is going to be that this is going to cause, before we even get to that, this is going to cause um, a dollar depreciation, right? So I just want to take note of that. So this whole effect is going to cause a dollar depreciation, but it's also going to have a secondary effect of increasing the money supply in the economy. Now, we're not going to go into the long details of how money supply affects the rest of the economy, but I do want you to recall from your previous macro classes that money supply is usually going to affect interest rates within the economy. And so the way in which this would work is an increase in the money supply should, dot, 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 after a long explanation that I'm not going to give you, should cause what to happen to average interest rates in the economy? Money supply goes up, decrease in interest rates. So there's a negative relationship we should expect in normal circumstances between those two. So interest rates in the U.S. go down. Now, this change in interest rates is what can cause a persistent effect upon the exchange rate value for a longer period of time. Because this drop in interest rates means that the rate of return on dollars. Now, we're going to look at this from the interest rate parity theory and recall that the interest rate parity theory says that the rate of return on dollars in this case, which this is equal to, is going to become less than the rate of return on pounds if we had interest rate parity prevailing in the original equilibrium. Now what this is going to do is this is going to reinforce the immediate effect on the foreign exchange market causing the dollar to depreciate. Because now, with an inflow of money into the economy and a lowering of average interest rates, which might take a little while before it actually comes about, and you start to see the effect in the banking um, sector itself. And it depends on how big of an influx of money that the central bank in, engages in here. But if that's big enough and the interest rates are noticeable and they come down a little bit, then you're going to end up with investors recognizing now that U.S. interest rates and rates of return are less than their expectation about rates of return on British pound deposits. And this is going to cause private investors to do what? It's going to cause them to increase their demand for pounds. Private demand for pounds is now going to be reinforced and is going to increase, and that's going to help sustain the change in the exchange rate value in this floating exchange rate system. Now, the point of this whole exercise is to demonstrate that central banks <coughs> can, if they so desire, intervene in the foreign exchange market, and or they could even inter intercede in the market without going to the foreign exchange market, and they could change the money supply internally within the country so as to force U.S. interest rates downward. So through central bank actions, if they can lower the U.S. interest rate, 
That's going to make pounds more attractive. It's going to make dollars less attractive to investors, and it's going to force a depreciation of the dollar. So if that was their goal when they set off in this exercise, they can achieve that goal by virtue of lowering the interest rates of the U.S. economy. And they can achieve the goal in the short term by just stepping into the foreign exchange market and just demanding pounds and selling dollars. So the central bank can intervene and affect the value of the exchange rate in a floating exchange rate system. Now, the reason that's going to be important is because that's going to be important for a country that's trying to keep its value of exchange rate fixed at some particular level. Because what's going to happen for a country trying to fix its exchange rate is that the market is going to keep trying to push it up or down. And the central bank is going to have to come in and keep preventing the movement of the exchange rate up and down. So in this example, I'm imagining a floating exchange rate system where just the central bank has stepped in and decided it's going to try to push the exchange rate up or down. In this case, the dollar value down. And it enters into a foreign exchange transaction like this. The next step, we're going to talk about a country fixing its exchange rate, having to be forced into this kinds of transaction in order to keep its currency value fixed. And we'll tell that story in a few minutes. Okay, so this is how a central bank can intervene to affect its floating exchange rate. We've got an equilibrium condition, IRP, interest rate parity condition, says the following. It says that the rate of return on dollars should turn out to be equal to the expected rate of return on pounds in the marketplace. And if we were to write out that condition in its explicit form, it would work out to be I dollar, left-hand side, is equal to, I'll write it this way, E dollar, E expected dollar per pound divided by the spot rate, dollar per pound, times one plus the British interest rate minus one. So that's the interest rate parity condition that we talked about before. Let's suppose we consider a situation of fixed exchange rates. And let's imagine that investors are looking at the dollar per pound, but let's imagine the dollar or the pound has decided they're going to fix their currency to the other one. So the exchange rate is ostensibly fixed and is not going to change or vary in the next months or years. Government has announced we're going to fix it and we're going to stay by that. We're going to, it's a credible and believable fix that's in place. Well, if the exchange rate is fixed and it's believed by investors that it's going to remain fixed, then if we look at this interest rate parity condition from the floating system, we can think about how it's going to change because of that. In particular, with fixed exchange rates, an investor's expected exchange rate a year from now should be exactly equal to the rate that prevails today, right? So if that's true, then EE is going to take on exactly the same value as E is. It's the value that the government is fixing it at. And that means that this ratio is going to become 1 under fixed rates. EE over E is 1 because it's the same number. And if that becomes 1, then this reduces on the right side to 1 plus the British interest rate minus 1. Well, guess what? That's just the British interest rate. And that means under fixed exchange rate, the interest rate parity condition is actually interest rate parity, the equality of interest rates between the two countries. This is the condition that would have to prevail in a fixed exchange rate system. It's a lot simpler. And it also is exactly what the terminology we use is describing. Interest rate parity means the equality of interest rates. The reason why we continue to use that term, rather than calling it rate of return parity, which is what we really should be calling it now, is because a lot of terminology was derived prior to 1973 when the U.S. was in a fixed exchange rate system and interest rate parity is what every country was trying to achieve. So interest rate parity was the norm, and as we adjusted to a floating exchange rate system, the terminology was maintained, even though the mechanics and the, um, the equations shifted because of the different circumstances. 
All right. So now, what are we going to do with this? We're going to evaluate what happens, what a country has to do in order to maintain a fixed exchange rate. So now, we go back to this diagram. Let's suppose U.S. fixes to the British pound. Fixes the dollar to the U.K. pound. So I'm going to draw a supply and demand curve here, just like before. But now I'm going to draw a hard, solid line across at the equilibrium value. Shade it, make it nice and dark. And I'm going to mark it as E bar, dollar per pound. So suppose the U.S. fixes the dollar to U.K. pound at the rate E bar, dollar per pound. So you've still got private players in the marketplace, suppliers and demanders of pounds, want to shift their currencies from one country to another to take advantage of different investments. But the government is now mandating that all exchanges for currencies have to take place at the government rate of E-bar. Now we're starting off with a situation here where E-bar happens to be at the equilibrium where market supply and market demand are equal to each other. All right, now. When the central bank fixes to a currency, a lot of things can happen in the private market that would tend to upset the value of the currency. So private traders are going to increase supply and demand for pounds, they're going to shift around, and as they shift around, supply and demand is likely to intersect at a point that lies off of that E-bar line. And when it does, the central bank has got a couple of choices. Number one, they could just leave it alone and just say, well, we don't care if you'd like to exchange at another exchange rate. We don't care if supply and demand is going to be equal at some other exchange rate. By law, you have to exchange at the rate we're saying, and we're going to require that you exchange at that particular rate. So you could just mandate by law and put stiff penalties into place for anybody that tries to exchange at a different rate. All right, that method has been tried. The problem with that method is if the currency value in the market drifts away from that fixed exchange rate line for a long period of time, you're likely to develop black markets where people will make exchanges at other rates anyway, and the government can kind of lose control of its exchange rate system by virtue of that. You'll often have an official exchange rate, you'll have unofficial exchange rates, you'll have markets working in, in distinct or um, kind of disconnected ways, and it's not a, it's not a it's not a good way to manage a fixed exchange rate system. So, <clears throat> we're going to talk about a more effective way of maintaining a fixed exchange rate. So here, again, U.S. is fixing to the pound. The country's currency that you fix to is what we're going to call the reserve currency. So in this particular case, the reserve currency is the British pound because the U.S. dollar is choosing to fix to the pound. That's the reserve currency, and you're going to see in a minute why we call it that. Okay, let's walk through a change that might take place in the marketplace and think about how the central bank is going to have to respond to that particular change. Okay, let's suppose the following takes place. Now, before we go any further, we're at an equilibrium here where everything is nice and equal to supply and demand are equal to each other at the fixed exchange rates. We're going to imagine that interest rate parity prevails at that equilibrium, which implies that I dollar is equal to I pound because we're in a fixed exchange rate system. So the, exchange, uh, the interest rates on assets on average are equal in the U.S. and Britain. Now let's suppose, let's do it this way. Let's suppose there is a, a decrease in British interest rates. 
something goes on in Britain, they've changed their money supply, they've forced interest rates down. Private investors are going to see that, and what that's going to do is it's going to mean that I dollar is greater than I pound, right? And they're going to find that rates of return are higher in the U.S. than they are in Britain. That, in turn, is going to lead to an increase in demand for dollars on the foreign exchange market. And let's just think about it from the perspective of British investors who are now going to be drawn to the U.S. assets and demand those higher interest-bearing accounts instead. So there's an increased demand for dollars. But on this diagram, an increase in demand for dollars is going to mean what happens. There's an increase in demand for dollars. How does supply or demand for pounds change? You increase in demand for dollars and there's an increase in demand for pounds. There's a decrease in demand for pounds. No, if you're going to increase the demand for dollars, that's another side of the thing. So there might well be a decrease in demand for pounds, but what does this demand for dollars, how does it get reflected on the graph? Because remember, if you're increasing demand for dollars on the foreign exchange market, what are you coming to the market with? Pounds. pounds. So the increased demand for pounds on the foreign exchange market means you are increasing the supply of pounds. Now it's the American traders who are changing their demands on the other side, but I just want to focus on one of these so that we can simplify the effects. So the increase in demand for dollars is the same as saying there's an increase in supply of pounds. And let's just do that one switch. The, the demand curve may well also switch but all I want to do is to focus on a drop in the equilibrium exchange rate here that would prevail if we allowed floating exchange rates to persist. But what's going to happen here is that increase in demand for dollars or increase in supply of pounds more specifically is going to mean that the supply of pounds is greater than the demand for pounds at the exchange rate that's fixed at E bar. In a floating exchange rate system, that's going to force the pound value down and the dollar value up. The dollar should appreciate, the pound should depreciate in value. But the central bank now in the U.S. doesn't want to allow that to happen. So the central bank is going to intervene, and instead of allowing this exchange rate to prevail, they need to intervene to try to get the exchange rate back somewhere else. And so this is what they're going to do. Because supply is greater than the demand, the Fed, or the central bank, is going to intervene. They intervene by doing the opposite of what's going on in the market. The market has too great of a supply of pound, too little demand for pound. So the central bank is going to come in and they're going to buy pounds they're going to demand pounds, in other words, and they're going to sell dollars. That offsets the disequilibrium over here, and the way it offsets it is by increasing the demand out to this level here. So this is the central bank doing this. Demand for pounds is going to rise up after the supply of pounds has shifted to the right. And as a result of that, it's going to keep the exchange rate at E bar. So they're going to be acting like a buyer or seller of currency of last resort, if you will. If the private market can't supply all of the desires and demands of the private traders, the central bank steps in and says, we're here, we'll make up any of the difference. And will make up any difference to keep the exchange rate at the credible fixed exchange rate E bar. Now, really quickly, this effect is going to do the following, and this becomes really important. This effect is going to be that the U.S. central bank is selling dollars and buying up pounds. We did that transaction just a few minutes ago. And if they sell dollars and, um, and buy pounds, what does that do to the U.S. money supply? Selling dollars to the market is going to increase the money supply in the market. 
because they're selling dollars, they're floating more dollars onto the, uh, the foreign exchange market, there's more market uh, money in circulation. It's coming from out of the hands of the Fed. If it's in their hands, it's not in circulation, it's not a part of the money supply. Once they release it to the private market on the foreign exchange market, it's going to increase the money supply. But if they increase the money supply, what does that do to U.S. interest rates? It's going to cause interest rates to drop. And what's ultimately going to happen is I dollar falls until I dollar is equal to I pound again. So what set this whole thing off in motion is the drop in the British interest rate. The drop in the British interest rate inspired changes in the foreign exchange market on the private side. The central bank steps in and satisfies all of the extra supply of pounds or demand, um, um, the excess demand for dollars. They supply it by selling dollars to the market and buying up pounds. That in turn has an effect upon the interest rates that prevail in the U.S. market, causing them to drop. The ultimate effect then is that we get back to interest rate parity and the exchange rate remains at its fixed level. 